you have your Bibles, let's open this morning to John, the 17th chapter. John, the 17th chapter. I want to thank the Lighthouse Baptist Church family for the support that you have given to Cindy and I at least eight years, maybe even more. What a blessing to meet Mrs. Foster this morning. Um, what a blessing her husband was for many, many years as the missions emphasis guy here in this church. And was he ever wound up? What a blessing. And we know that we all, you all miss him. I want to thank the many ladies. Ladies, raise your hand. If you sign your name to a card and send it to Brother Bill Bowen, raise up your hands. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Many, many, many. Even some pastors maybe have done that. I'm aware that God answers prayer. And you know, we say that and we practice it. And I try to pray for this church every week. And you've been through... Um, an amazing building program and all the pressures upon your dear pastor and staff here. And thank you for those who have stood with him and prayed with him and encouraged your staff and your pastors and the pastor's wives. Uh, you have been brought to a wonderful, wonderful place in God's history. What is the future of this church? What is God going to do here? That's exciting. And um, I'm thankful that I've had a small part just being able to be one of your missionaries um, God has given me a wonderful year. Last April at the board meeting, I changed from being vice president of church mobilization. I uh, had a staff under me, a secretary, me and representatives, and was leading up in that ministry. I trained another man, and he took over my position. That was kind of challenging to have a Timothy and see him rise to the occasion and continue with that. And then I moved off to the side, uh, being the international representative of the mission which basically would mean I would just continue doing more of what I've been doing, representing and preaching in conferences, traveling overseas. So in the very first year of being the international representative of the mission, I had the privilege of, of traveling to Ghana to our Africa Regional Conference. And then I was in India. I'll be going back to India this summer. So you've been a part of that ministry. I never dreamed 20 years ago when I made my first visit to India to a Bible college called South India Baptist Bible College, Dr. Petey Cherian that um, years would pass and I would uh, become one of the missions professors, adjunct maybe, whatever they call it, a missions professor. I'll be going back again, Lord willing, in August. That will be my 15th trip to India to teach there at, there at the Bible College. I think the, probably this coming fall they'll have maybe 400 students or so. Uh, what a privilege that has been. That's been one of your ministries. Amazing, last year when I was there, I had 57 students. They come from all over India they speak a multitude of languages, come from very primitive places and many, many states throughout the whole of India. And I have the privilege of lighting a fire under their souls uh, for the cause of missions and teaching them what does the Bible teach about missions. We teach the history of missions. We teach world religions and uh, the practical applications of what a missionary is, what is he supposed to do, all of those things. And I find myself totally engulfed and totally excited and to think that I'm teaching this to students I'll never see, probably, after they graduate. They just had graduation March the 10th. They go all over India starting churches. But one day in heaven, there'll be people that'll be standing up from all those tribes and nations and places throughout Asia because of the influence of missionaries there in that place. And you've been a part of that. Thank you. Uh, I told Mrs. Washer this morning, I know that the ladies here have prayed for me and others have prayed because as I have traveled to other countries, I was in Ghana, then I was in India, then I went to the Philippines to our Far East Regional Conference. I came back and went and taught missions in Dominican Republic. And then I just got back from three weeks from Peru. So that was my first year as the international representative of the mission for whatever that means. But what a privilege. What a family of God we have. Many places I go, I can't speak their language, but the language of the family of God is awesome. And you look into the faces as we did this morning in the, uh, uh, in the, in the DVD and know God is gathering out of this world of people to himself. Uh, some ugly like you and me and some, some good looking people, some poor people, some rich people, the family of God. One day we're going to be assembled. It will happen. Revelations 5 and Revelation 7 says that out of all the world, all the languages and the tribes and the people, they're going to be in heaven worshiping him. That's the end. That will happen. And we're back here helping to make it happen in a sense, working alongside what God is doing in our world, bringing in the harvest and being part of missions as it will happen one day. And some have said one day the harvest will be over. 
The rapture of the church will take place. We will no longer be here. We won't need a missions conference. They, there will not be faith promised missions in heaven. There won't be any pastors there either. No, that's... Or missionaries. Eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. But until then, we're not finished. Thank God that you continue to have a missions emphasis in your church. How do I have a heart for God and his world? That's a theme of the work that I've been doing for many years and continues to be my theme as the international representative. I find that difficult. How do I have a heart for God and for his world? We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's go to Jesus' high priestly prayer in John the 7th chapter, beginning in verse 3 down to verse 7. This is not an expository message. It'll be a message that will deal with the text here briefly, and then we'll try to make some applications as was recommended by Pastor regarding being involved in God's world. Let's pray. Father, you are doing a wonderful work in our world, and we are unworthy to be a part of it. You are taking out of this world sinners facing the wrath of God and saving them and making them saints. Thank you for saving us, Father. Why us? Why us, Lord, when there are three billion people without ever having heard the gospel in any way around our world? Three billion. We can't even imagine that, Father. Lord, would you speak to our hearts? Would you use me in some small way, even this morning, to stir our hearts for you? Help us to have a heart for God and a heart for his world. In Jesus' name, amen. In February 1973, Cindy and I went before the board of BIMI to be missionaries. We had no earthly idea what that meant. We were quickly approved. That we, get, we were given a parachute, and we jumped out of the plane into the land of Norway. <laughs> that began our missionary career 43 years ago. God has been so good. God has been so good. And he's still teaching us. I want to have a heart for God. How about you? I guess that's why you're here. If you're just here to fill up the hour and go home and clock it off what I did that good thing for God, forget it. God wants to have your heart. Pastor tries to get it every Sunday morning to direct your attention to God. He wants your heart. And if he doesn't have our heart, missions will close this evening as we end the banquet. We'll burp and go home. And we'll go about our duties. That's usually what happens in many churches. Missions is just on the docket. It's part of the thing that we do throughout the year. I believe the greatest need of our church is that we have revival. We need God. We need to have a heart for God. The Lord is finishing his ministry. He's on the way to the cross. And somehow by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we get to hear part of his prayer life. Wouldn't he have loved to heard Christ pray? Peter, James, and John didn't think so. They went to sleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. But here John records these precious verses. Let's look in our text. John 17, verses 3, down to verse 6. And this is the life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before thee, uh, with thee before the world was, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. We'll read some other verses there in the 17th chapter, so keep your Bibles still open. I wrote down, Jesus was very conscious that the Father had sent him into the world. And he reminded his disciples and those he spoke to of this divine mission. Matter of fact, over and over again, he emphasized this. I went back and got my strong concordance just to make sure that what I was saying was true. And over 30 times in the book of John, Jesus says this over and over again. I've been sent by God. Wow, what a thought. That'd be a great sermon, Pastor. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew where he came from. He knew his purpose on earth. And he looked forward to the glory that he would have in heaven again 
with God the Father. And from the cross he cried, it is finished. What a victorious Savior. He came into this world to do the will of the Father. Having a heart for God and his world will require of us the same death to self that Jesus had. The same submission, not thy, my will, but thine be done. It will require the same dedication to God's purposes. I'm here to do his will. I'm here to give his message. I have no other agenda. I'm on a mission from God. And so are you and I. We are sent ones out into his world. We are his witnesses. And we see the Holy Ghost passion that followed him through all that God did in his life that he would fulfill God's perfect will for his life and ours. And I wrote this down. Missions is not being a tourist in God's world. Now, I like going places. I've been to India. This will be the 16th trip this fall. I've never yet seen the Taj Mahal. Sort of discouraging. I don't go there. Sometimes I go directly to the Bible school. I teach for two weeks. I get back on the plane and I leave and I'm not seen much. I don't go there as a tourist. I was just in Peru. I was within hours of Machu Picchu. How many have been to Machu Picchu? Anyone? Anyone know where that is? Heard about it? It's beautiful, isn't it? I didn't go there as a tourist. I'll go back another time though. Missions is not just being a tourist in God's world, but seeing the world through God's eyes. We saw some of that in Sunday school this morning. Seeing the world through God's eyes. People are souls for whom Christ died. But isn't it amazing that the world is not just over there? They're here in our world, in America. They run the 7-Eleven. They run the Dunkin' Donuts. They run some of the other coffee shops. They're from people from all around our world. They're here. Hello. They're at our universities. International students who need Christ. And they may be your doctors or your dentists or your nurses. But we need to see the world through God's eyes and communicate his message into his world wherever we are. It's interesting that when John writes his books... The Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and the book of the Revelation, that he uses this word world 99 times. It is the world, it is the world. He quotes John the Baptist Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And the Jewish people probably cringe, The world? Because they had no concept. It was salvation is of the Jews. Thank you, God. But the world, the Gentiles, they call them the dogs. You mean those other people? John, of course, writes some 50 years after Christ's ministry, and he saw the fulfillment of all that Jesus died for. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I want you to make disciples and start churches and see them reproduce. He was able to see exactly what Christ wanted to accomplish and what he had commanded that the gospel would then go from Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the earth. No wonder who you would write about. It is the world. For God so loved the world. It is the world. You're having a world missions conference. It is, it's them. It's not us. And what a world it is. As I've had the privilege of flying into Mumbai, Bombay, 16, 17 million people in South America, all these cities, all these places with millions and millions and millions. We can't comprehend it. pastor's heart is that you would reach Newark for Christ. What a cosmopolitan place this is. All the people that walk the streets here and go to Walmart and to the coffee shops. Man, I got hungry for coffee this morning, didn't you? Those that were in Sunday school. I don't know about a piece of steak or not, but that was close. But notice in verse 6, John 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. That could be a sermon. Thank God for salvation. Why would God save me? Take me out of the world to salvation. But drop down into verse 11. And now Jesus says, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. 
And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And there's that idea, Christ has brought us not only to salvation, he's taken us out of the world system into his family. We're still here, hello. You got up and looked in the mirror this morning and said, oh boy, I got a lot of work to do before I go to church, huh? The Lord has left us in this world. Maybe some of you that are older and have a lot of pain and have a lot of problems would pray, Lord, take me out of this world. I don't want to be here anymore. But for the most part, we're all here, aren't we? We're in this world. But look at verse 14. Further in Jesus' prayer, he said, I've, I've given them thy word, that the, and, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even if, as I am not of the world. And we, so we've spent maybe 50 years in fundamentalism and independent Baptist churches trying to figure out what that means, not of the world. The Lord saves us out of the world. He leaves us in the world, but we're not to be of this world. We're not to follow the patterns and the philosophy of this world. We're not to love this world, the things of the world. Maybe sometimes we've gotten sort of hung up with some of those things and gone off into the, the list of ten things. And if I, do the, if I don't do those ten things, then I must be okay with God. And you still may not have a heart for God. You may be, as some people negatively say, well, you must be a legalist. Not of the world. We live up in Pennsylvania, so we have a lot of people there that they don't want to be of the world. And so somewhere in 1784 or whatever, they drew a line in the sand and said, okay, up to this point, the Industrial Revolution is not going to overtake us. We're not going to go any further. We'll only use horses and buggies, and we call them the Amish and the Mennonites and all that went there. But not of the world. Is that what Jesus meant? Charles Spurgeon stated it this way. It makes one sad to hear a Christian saying, well, there's no harm in that, and, and, and there's no harm in that, and thus getting as near to the world as possible. He says, grace is at a very low ebb in that soul, which can raise the question of how far I may go in worldly conformity. So I guess that's happened in some of our churches also. Uh, we want to see how close to the world we can get and still be fundamental, huh? <laughs> We'll see how close we can get to the world's culture and, and still sort of be a saint. <laughs> We're not really kind of um, interested in revival. Because revival has that thing of like maybe, you know, confessing your sins and moving away from the world and trying to draw near to God. I think that was a promise. God said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Hey, that sounds pretty good. But sometimes we are more concerned of being more like the world. We're trying to be cool in the world, like the world. And yet here... Jesus says you're not of the world. You're not of the world. What does it mean for you? Look at John 17, verse 18. The reason we're not to be like this world is that Jesus wants us to send us out into that world. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. As some have said the reason many people in the world don't want your Christianity is that your life has no taste of that which is heavenly. You're more like the world than them. They think, well, there's no real difference. Why should I be a Christian? I mean, if, if, if you're the Christian, it's very, very humbling, isn't it? Do people see Christ in me? Do they see Christ in my attitudes, the way I live, and the things that would conform me to his will? So Christ's purpose is that we'll be not of the world, but that he would send us into that world and why? Look at verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And we think, oh God, is, is my life in such a way that people would be attracted to Christ or repelled away from Christ? Is our church, our churches, permeated with the very presence of God so that if someone comes into our midst, they say, God is here. Don't you desire that? I do. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me and that they would believe. 1 John 4, 14 says, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And so he is taking the people out. Am I ready to be a light for God 
in this world. People need Christ. We could ask the question, are you a world Christian? Are you a world vision Christian? Jesus said, the field is the world. And I'm, am I prepared to be that light that he wants me to be out into this world? He tells us to go out into this world, not to stay within my fortress or, or my little family. And, and, and as I said once before, we pull our fundamental blanket over our head and we pray for the rapture. <laughs> no. He wants us to go out into our world. It was said that there was a travel agency near Harvard University that actually advertised that way on the sign in their business that said, please go away. <laughs> they were selling tours. There's a mission board that also has that as a theme. Please go away. Well, that's what God said to Abraham. Abraham, I want you to go away, buddy. I want you to see my world. And Abraham said, okay, I'll go. What a wonderful, wonderful story. How much of the world did Abraham know when God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees? Ur of the Chaldees? Where is that? <laughs> I had to look it up. It's Mesopotamia. I didn't know where that was either. <laughs> about 220 miles southeast of Baghdad. We've heard about Baghdad. It was over there. God would call this man, a man that became the father of faith, to travel and walk all the way to the promised land. Later he goes into Egypt. Get out of your country to a land that I will show you. And Abraham departed. It even says he didn't even know where he was going. But if you're going with God, who cares? Huh? I'm willing to go, Lord. Let's go. Another story from the Old Testament. God wanted Jonah to go out into his world. And Jonah says, ah, no, 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 no. Not Nineveh. And you heard that story. Even this dis disobedient prophet knew where Nineveh was and where the far western uh, part of the European con continent was, Tarsus, now Spain, and chose, I think I'll take a vacation, Lord. And you know the rest of the story. God wanted Isaiah to go away and see his world. And Isaiah said, I'll go, Lord. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he said, Here am I. Send me. God wanted Paul to go away and see his world, and Paul answered, I'll go. No wonder Paul's desire was to reach those of the regions beyond. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 16, it says that he preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. I didn't know where Illyricum was either, so I had to look that up. It says Yugoslavia, that's gone. <laughs> now it's Serbia and Croatia. That's a big distance. That's like preaching the gospel from here all the way to Orlando, Florida. And walking all the way. Maybe you rode a camel or a donkey somewhere along the line. Took a ship every once in a while. But here was a man who gave his life for the regions beyond. Robert Moffat was an old missionary in the area we call Botswana now. He had been there for over 50 years. Started the first Christian churches. Uh, translated the Bible. His son-in-law was David Livingston. More well known as one of the older missionaries but Robert Moffat told David Livingston, David, do not sit down in lazy contentment. Do not choose an old missionary station. Push on to the vast, unoccupied district of the north. In that direction on a clear morning, I've seen the smoke of a thousand villages. There no missionaries ever been. There, sir, is your field. And history says that David Livingston became that great explorer and Christian missionary. I stood there by the Zambezi about eight years ago. And saw the great statue of that great man of God who said, I'll go. I'll go to those villages in the north that have never been occupied. The church our brother mentioned in Iceland used to support us when we were there in Norway. Wonderful to know that that work continues to go on there. William Carey was a Baptist pastor, part-time, shoe cobbler, teacher. And there in his shoe cobbling shop, you could call it, he made a leather map of the world and would cry out to God, Oh, God, I want to be a world Christian. I want, to, I want to know you. But, God, what about those people in so many lands? He read all kinds of books about the countries, and he prayed for the world, and eventually himself, God would tap on the shoulder and say, William, how about you? Why don't you go to India? He went 40 years. He never came back on a furlough. He left in 1793. And little did he know that because of his moving and going and the first and second great awakening and what God was doing in England and America, a whole new missionary movement would move forward out into our world. 
They would later call him the father of modern day missions because he would go. Simple man with a heart for God. Hudson Taylor spent several years in China as a missionary and then returned back to England to recuperate. It was said that on the wall of his bedroom there, he put a map of the whole vast empire of China. I can't imagine, he probably would faint if he heard how many people were in China now. A billion people! It was from that sickbed that he prayed for China. Oh God, we need to do something for China. And the China Inland Mission was born. Taylor himself said, I feel as if I could not live if something's not done for China. If I had a thousand lives, I'll give them all to China. I want to have a heart for God and a heart for his world. Thank you for being a missionary-minded church. Thank you for putting feet to your prayers by sending your own out. I pray that God would raise up some from this own congregation to go out. Thank you for your prayers for missions. Thank you for your giving. It is no small thing when a widow takes the mites that she has and gives it to missions that God's word would go forward and missionaries would be encouraged. I have over 30 churches that support me. I receive no, no funds whatsoever from home office. And you know I have nine widow ladies that support me. Nine widow ladies that support me. And as I am preaching and praying and, and traveling around the world and serving God, there are those who will receive the rewards for that. They have labored together. And you're doing that as a church family. Continue doing that. How can I know him better? How can I make him known I encourage you to get to know God better. Read his word and pray and serve him and others. I've been a Christian 47 years. I'm still learning to read God's word. I'm still learning to pray. It does become something that we just sort of check off. I can do that. I want to know God better. Paul's prayer. He was a missionary for over 20 years. Itinerant ministry. He's locked up in the jail. He soon will give his head to Nero. And his prayer from his heart is, I want to know God that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We don't often pray that, do we? <laughs> the suffering part. Being made conformable unto his death. You think, man, I thought he was a successful missionary. What's he saying? He wants to know God. We all need to know God more. We need to know him better. Ask God for opportunities to let your shine, light shine for him. Interesting that Herbert Cain, an old missiologist, had written a book called Wanted World Christians. And it's about becoming a world Christian, not a worldly Christian. And Cain gives some suggestions that I wanted to give to you this morning uh, about how you and I can become a better world Christian. The first thing... Regarding information is that we can ask, what can I learn? I found the, the, the DVD this morning. That was interesting. That expanded your mind. And the pastor brings into your church uh, missions conferences and speakers. We can grow in our knowledge of God's global village. Watch the news. Listen to what's happening in God's world. It is a global village. It is a village that's filled with economically uh, disaster, with the rich and the poor, a physically diseased world poverty-stricken world. Everything's not like we have it in Newark. I can guarantee that. Socially deprived world. It is a politically unsettled world. Refugees. We have a missionary that's started about three or four churches in Beirut, Lebanon. And I asked him, how many Syrian refugees do you have coming across the border from Syria into Lebanon? He said, two million. Yes. I said, well, what's the population of Lebanon? Four million. How do you absorb two million people into your country? But they're there. <clears throat> and God is doing a work. Henry Martin was a missionary to India and Persia. And he stated this. One of the greatest foes of missions is prejudice, or prejudice and indifference. Prejudice and indifference. And ignorance is the mother of them both. The greatest foes of missions are prejudice and indifference. And ignorance is the mother of them both. Take the information that you get 
and find information. There's much out there that we can find. There's websites, the Joshua Project. There's the book Operation World. I use it in India. We pray over the whole country of India, state by state in our class. But Operation World has a, uh, several pages on every country on the face of the earth. You can use it as a prayer manual. How awesome it is to learn about God's world and what God is doing. We're a very small mission, International Partnership Ministries. Uh, as the men give their reports throughout the year, last year when they turned in the reports, they reported that over 9,200 people came to know Christ as Savior. Amazing, amazing. The family of God has just been enlarged around the world because of the missionary outreach in 23 countries that we have. And they were able to start 55 new churches in various places. There are many fundamental mission boards. This is what's happening in God's world. William Carey would be, he'd, he'd turn charismatic, I guess, if he heard how large the family of God is going to be in heaven. They're going to be from all the tribes and all the nations and all these people groups. How are they going to get there? Because someone told the message. Some church like Lighthouse Baptist Church said, hey, we're going to get in this thing of missions. We're going to fund our missionaries and pray for our missionaries. They're bringing in the harvest. It's not over yet. That is what God is doing. I could give you reports from Korea, Iran, China. They say now the population of Christians, there are some 50 to 70 million Christians. Even after the missionaries have been thrown out for over 50 years, God is bringing in a wonderful, wonderful harvest. But one missions leader said it this way. What difference does it make then to American churches and believers to know all these things? We're exposed to all these things and information about countries and needs and people groups. Then he says this, the difference depends on how we respond. Information from the world as well as information from the Bible demands obedient action. God gives us his information to shatter our comfortable isolation. I like that expression. We're introduced to a world that's without God. And we're sort of basking in, well, thank you, God, that you saved me. And we pull our fundamental blanket over our head and say, well, thank you, Jesus, that you're coming back. I hope it's today. There's a world out there that needs the message of the cross. We need to share what we have in God's world. It may be your goods and your wealth. Thank you for committing to faith promise and giving uh, to missions in that way, some very sacrificially at times. Thank you that you can share your time and your talents Peter says that we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That may be teaching and training children and helping in the youth department, <coughs> setting up the table for a banquet, doing visitation, praying for your pastor, visiting the sick. There's so many things that we can do with our time and our talents. You can share your writing skills if you got 40 missionaries out there, some of you could write letters to them, personal letters, and I get some letters from different ones. I'm thankful for them. And the ladies that write in their ladies' meetings and also various ways that you can communicate with your missionaries and be an encouragement to them. Share your home and hospitality. Sometimes you may have different speakers or you may have um, nationals that come into your midst and maybe you have an opportunity to have someone in your home. Just this past week, we had one of our church planners from Ghana around our table. Our um, home office coordinator, Marta Galdam, is from, Sa from El Salvador and some other people. And this week we had Raymond Abu Mikhail from Lebanon. We love having people in our home. They won't take your silverware. They might use chopsticks anyway. <laughs> We did have an African pastor who went back to his country and he was learning about our culture and he told some of his other African friends that when you come to America, you don't have to bring your own toothbrush because I found out that every bathroom I went into, <laughs> there were four or five. What a blessing it is that we can share our home and we can broaden our prayer life. As I mentioned before, I'm still learning to pray for missions. I have a whole list of our own missionaries and our church supports in Hanover, Pennsylvania, about 30, 40. So I divide them up every day. I pray for five or six. That way I can cover the whole uh, gamut of all of them. And our church, uh, churches that support us. The author of Operation, uh, Operation World, John, Patrick Johnstone, said it this way. Prayer not only changes people and situations 
and even the courses of history, but also those who pray. It's dangerous for the enemy. It's also dangerous for you. (laughs) There's a price to pay to be a person who stands in the gap between fallen man and a righteous God. That price may mean becoming an answer to your own prayers and giving time and finances and even going out as a witness in your Jerusalem where you live now or your Judea or Samaria. We can learn to adopt a simple lifestyle in being a world Christian. That couple expressed that in that video. What does it mean to downsize for the cause of Christ? Sell everything in your garage and give it to missions? I don't know. Try it. (laughs) What can we do as affluent Western Christians? How can we live more sacrificially for the cause of missions? We're still learning. I'm still learning. And maybe you are too. Spend time overseas. Please send your pastor on mission trips. And please buy a round trip ticket. (laughs) (laughs) there are short-term missions that some mission boards offer involvement for short periods or even one or two years two-week projects full-time missionary service and as one pastor set up north in a church that he pastored he said our aim in our church is not to persuade everyone to become a missionary but to help everyone become a world christian have a heart for god and have a heart for his world And those who are not called to go out for the sake of the name are called to stay for the sake of the name. We are all his witnesses. And I would say God lays a burden upon certain people to be his missionaries in the fact that they go overseas and they cross geographical and cultural boundaries to reach a people for Christ. What is the spiritual challenge for being a world Christian? We must catch that vision that the Lord had. I'm here to please my father. My father, my father, my father. Jesus told the disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. That's what a missions conference is. It's just so short. It's so brief. We're so busy. But we have an opportunity to lift up our eyes just briefly and and catch a glimpse of God's world. God is out there. And God is doing something in our world, and he wants you to join him. That's the exciting part about that. Jesus saw the multitudes, and may we also see that. When Paul waited in Athens, he was not a tourist there either. His spirit was stirred, it says in Acts 17. He saw the city wholly given to idolatry, and he stated his burden for the people. Even in Is- of Israel, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. God burdened his heart. I'm still working through that in my own life. Is it true that if I draw closer to God, he will give me a heart for his world? I think that's true. But then sometimes we get so taken up with just being near to God that we don't let him move us out to the world. So we have to let him move us, change us, that's part of that sanctification process that's going on. I don't want to just be a monk and, a, you, know, mm, you know, I want to be used of God out into his world. One pastor said it this way in closing, where passion for God is weak, passion and zeal for missions will be weak. And that's where I get the idea. I want to have a heart for God. Where passion for God is weak, where's your passion? On the passion monitor. Between 1 and 10, where's your passion for God? Where's your passion for the world? Someone said there was a a couple that had gone to India. It's supposed to be a true story. They were eating in a nice restaurant. And there are nice restaurants, expensive restaurants. And there are all of these people on on the streets, street people, street families that live and die there in many of the big cities. Such a contrast. And they said as this couple were eating in this restaurant, these poor people from the outside came up and looked at them and their food and their their table. Can you imagine someone doing that to you at Perkins or Bob Evans or whatever? And the waiter was shocked and he he, he comes and apologizes. (laughs) He said, I'm sorry, I'll pull the blind down and they'll go away. 
a missions conference could be that way also. That we just enjoy the good things that God has given us and the world is looking on at Lighthouse Baptist Church and say, wow, tell us about this God that loves me and that will forgive me of my sins. I've never heard. We don't have that spiritual food that you're, we don't have that light, we don't have the living water. No, we're just going to pull the blind down. We don't want the world disturbing us. Don't let that happen with your missions conference. Let God touch your heart for him. Let God touch your heart for the needs that are out there. And not that it's just an emotional response, but Lord, plug me in somewhere in your world so that I can glorify you. Father, 